hanging around makers are a little bit more to come, I'm sure. Brett, do you want to introduce yourself? Are you in the cab today? Yeah, welcome. Welcome to the office today, which is in the cab of an 8120 of all things. Um, so, yeah. Um, thanks, Tom. So, yeah, um, my background is case, but um, primarily uh, I've been a harvester mechanic for more than 30 years now and uh, worked on all makes and models and machines, including the green fellas. I worked for a green dealer in South Australia for a while. And, uh, and I did one, one year's um, harvester support for CNH as a New Holland guy. Um, not that my background is New Holland, but I know a reasonable amount about them. So anyway, but what I'm gonna do is um, tell you about uh, what we've learned um, with, with playing with our red harvesters for over 30 years. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. So early on in the early 90s, I had a friend that had a pair of um, 1480s and one was a pretty good header and the other one was pretty average. Um, and we were trying to work out, you know, why and what the difference was between the two machines. And we found that the average one, the concave wasn't, you could never align the concave correctly. It wasn't, wasn't parallel to the rotor. And so we, um, you know, being farmers and bush mechanics, I suppose, um, we took all the anchor bar mechanism out of that machine and we took the mounting plates over to the workshop and took to them with a gas ax. And the idea was to try and put that concave in the same position as the other machine and see if that's what was making it no good, if you know what I mean, or not as good. So we went and did that and we made the bad one better than the good one. So that was an interesting thing. And I think it was because we were even more precise with the way that we set it up. So then of course we went back, did the other one and we ended up with a, with a pair of pretty reasonable headers. So those machines were in there, you know, high twenties, you know, 25 to 30 ton an hour machines um, once we had finished that. So that started me thinking, but the other thing that happened was that the bad one used to break rotor belts in lupins you know, in those tough waddy conditions and it stopped. So I started thinking about, you know, the relationship of rotor position to engine load and, and rotor belt life. So I started to play um, and one of, my, one of my good friends bought a little 1460, uh, sorry, 1460, a little 1640 when the 16s first came out and uh, being a 1640, it hasn't got any horsepower and it's not a very big header. Um, but he gave it to me every Sunday when he went off to church. And um, that little machine had a that little machine had a yield monitor in it. It was the first yield monitor I'd ever seen in a header. And by using that and going, I'm going to play with this concave position and see what we can achieve. Um, so I would go and harvest a box full of grain move the concave positioning and set it all back up and go and harvest the box full of grain. And over the period of one harvest, I got a whole bunch of data that sort of told me roughly where I needed to put that concave. So the next year, uh, and I was able to do this guys because I was working for myself at the time. And so the next year, another friend of mine said, oh, will you come drive my header for me? So he bought a couple of 1688s, um, he went to a clearing sale to buy one, bought two for the price of one. We took one in the shed and I drove the other one for five years. But what I did was I thought, hang on a minute, I'm gonna go and put my concave position where, where I reckon it should be and I'll see what it does. And that, that little 1688 was a mid thirties ton an hour header all day, every day. And um, my limiting factor harvesting lupins on that was I just couldn't get them in the front. There was just everything that we did with the front, um, that was its limiting factor. And the machine was so nice to set up. I would harvest lupins all night and harvest cereal all day. And every second day I would sleep the night, if that makes sense to you guys. So I would drive a header for 30, 35 or 36 hours. And then I'd have 12 hours where I would sleep. 
And that's how we got through our 10,000 acre program. And the things that I learned from that was all I had to do with that machine to go from harvesting lupins to harvesting my cereal, my wheat, was change the rotor gearbox, change no setting. Okay. And, and the machine was just lovely. And its losses were really low, like never, never, ever anywhere near a 1% loss. Right. So let's advance 20 years and go into a flagship. We know what we can do with an early machine. You know, the, we'd, we'd get 40 tonne an hour out of a 2388 with a 40 foot front on it, okay, or a 39 foot Macdon, okay, in a four tonne wheat crop. So it is achievable. When we went to the flagships, everyone told me there's no point playing with concave positioning. It makes no difference, okay? And everyone is aware that that concave positioning on the flagship is pinch point at six o'clock, like right at the bottom of the concave. Okay. And what we tend to get is left hand loading, right? Because what happens is the material is coming in and you're squeezing it through and through your pinch point. And then when it releases it, that's where it unloads its grain. So you will end up with probably 70 to 85% of your material on the left-hand side of your sieve, right? So then Mr. Case in his infinite wisdom goes, oh, hang on a minute, I'll just go over to the screen over here and I'll put an offset in there. And you offset the sieve so the material moves across. But that's an imperfect process. So I started wondering what would happen if we moved it and whether it would do what the early machines did. Because by moving them, we were able to even up the sieve loading and that was the big ticket item, right? It does the same thing. And what we've done is over the last four years, well, I started doing it about six years ago with machines that we were trying to get some horsepower from. But over the last four years, we've done probably something like a hundred machines across WA. And we've moved that concave 10 millimeters to the right. And later on today, I'm going to go and move one that I moved two years ago. And we actually moved at 12 mil. And what we're finding is that it's actually loading the right hand side more than the left. So I'm going to move it back two mil today. And I know two mil sounds like nothing, but it's an astronomical amount for the way that the machine separates. So the fellows that we were with yesterday, um, just over at Darren, we did their 7240 last harvest. And Graham's kept the book of every loss test that he's done, right? And so we started looking from three years ago with the same header. And his, his canola average losses were over two and a half percent, which they thought was pretty good. Of over a hundred loss tests that they did last harvest, his average losses are under 0 0.05, they're three, and they've written it down in the number of canola seeds in a 1.5 metre drop tray. Three to six is the average of those drop tests. His losses have just gone, okay? And as Kane said to me last night, the last thing he said to me was, your cheat sheet's right, and I don't touch it. I don't have to change my settings, morning, noon, night. I'm not chasing it all day. The thing is linear and it works and we just don't mess with it, right? But it's about a four step process, guys. Level and zero your concave as per the factory so that you know that it's parallel to the rotor and it's level, okay? Shift your concave 10 millimeters to the right. Shim all your rasp bars so that they're all as even as you can get to within a millimetre, because we've found that even with brand new rasp bars, there's up to a six millimetre difference in the height. So what you can have is you bolt them on randomly, you're gonna have two bars that are six mil higher than the ones alongside it, right? So we do all of that. We also run a much, much, much wider concave opening. So the average of the guys across here they start their concave opening in cereals at 20. And a lot of guys are running mid 30s, 33 to 35 on their concave opening. 
So what this does is, because we've moved the concave across, we've increased the surface area of our pinch point. Instead of it being a single bar point, it's actually a multi-bar point on the left-hand side. And running it much more open, it holds a lot more straw in there, doesn't smash the living daylights out of it, and we get straw on straw thrashing. And when the straw stays intact, it's much, much, much easier to separate the grain out of it. Okay. Last thing that we do is we fill the separation grate with spike grass bars. And I know that's going to sound a bit strange, but what the spike grass bar does is it tears a hole in the crop mat, lets the grain out and agitates all the straw. Those four things, if you do them in isolation, what ends up happening, you, like just moving the concave will give you a gain, but it won't be the full thing. Just putting the spike rice bars in, in a lot of cases when we're handling two or more feet of straw, is actually going to have a negative effect on your horsepower because they take power to run. So your rotor, your rotor will use up to about 80% of your maximum available engine horsepower. So if you're trying to poke a four ton crop, you know, with big bulky straw through that little tiny pinch point this wide, 80% of your 500 horses is gonna to go to run on that rotor. So when we go and open it up, it still keeps thrashing. And I tell the guys over here, open the thing up till it stops thrashing. And then generally when they get to about 35 in their cereal, they go, it's at 35 and it's still thrashing. Do I keep opening it? And I said, if you're seeing a horsepower gain, do it. But if you don't leave it where it is, because you might not have to close it this evening when it comes in cool. Does that all, that all sort of make a bit of sense? Anyone got any comments at the moment? Brett, put your hand up on what side of the uh, what side of the concave you're moving. You're sitting in the header, facing forward, left hand side. This As is the right. Yeah. <laughs> this is my right hand. This is the right. If you're sitting in the seat, I'm moving it to the right. Okay. Very good. Do you want to just run through, Brett? And we've done it already all week. You don't want to mention the word corn. These machines are set up to harvest corn, but they're Yankee machines. But what happens to the to the material with, with, with grain material, cereal material going through the header without moving that concave? Um, so the thing about your concave, what it's trying to do, um, the very early machines, so the 1400 series that had the spiral, which is what your John Deere's got with your tri-stream rotor and, and that, it's actually rolling that material across the concave. That's, that's what it's trying to do. And that's why there's a distinct difference between the way you set up a case harvester and the way that you're gonna set up a, a John Deere, okay? A lot different, right? Um, they, they function differently internally. So with the specialty rotor that's in the, in the case machines, with those small club brass bars, they don't have a tendency to roll the material as hard what they have a tendency to do is agitate the material as it flows through over the concave. What we're, what we're doing by opening it is that we're, that we're reducing the impact on it and allowing the material to roll across itself, okay? Because we've got a bigger gap, right? When you go and put green material into these things, normally, and I mean, I used to get it with the old girls running um, and um, trying to harvest lupins. You get a little green patch and it just about kills them, right? The wider you can run your concave, the less effect that that has on, on, on your engine load factor, okay? So that's, that's the key point. Um, we find that, you know, canola is a crop the bulk of the thrashing is done before it even gets to our rotor anyway. The only down point, the downside that you can get with this is if it part pods um, your crop. So you get part thrashing coming up the feeder and through the transition cone and you can find, and if you kill stall the machine, you'll have a look and you might find part heads or unthrashed pods 
on the right hand side because they haven't gone through that thrashing process right so more often than not we've got to run either a, an extreme or hard thrash concave in the front on the right hand side because that material is just dumping straight on that uh, on that concave right um yeah so um, the other thing too that we find is um, a few of our guys bail their straw and they've gone and said that their bales stay together a lot better because your straw is intact. Um, if you're going to do this, you probably need to think about a chopper rather than having a beater because you're going to end up with full pieces of straw two feet long coming out the back of the header. Yeah, I've got a couple in there on Greg. Yeah, what's involved in actually moving the pinch point to the right, Tendo? So on the right-hand side of your machine, uh, you have a pair of uh, anchor brackets that the concave pivots off. You'll see that those anchor brackets are slotted. So once you have a definitive knowledge of where your concave is, you measure the distance inside that bracket, loosen it all off, move it your 10 mil, if you need to, you can slot that bracket. Now, C and H in their infinite wisdom, two years ago, because we were talking about doing this, <coughs> added some material to that bracket. So you actually are going to have more than enough material to move at the 10 mil quite okay. Right. Question back. Yeah, so you talk about putting spike bars um, in the back end of the road of the, in the separation area. Um, what yep. about straight bars or helical pickers or anything like that? Do you like any like that using those things? Right. So um, I, ref I refer to straight separator bars as uh, horsepower thieves. So if you want to be able to kill store your machine, you'll find that it won't stop unless it's got a pair of flat separator bars in it. Right. Um, that's what they do. But they're a dozer blade. When that's pushing straight into the crop mat, all it does is trap material. And what's in that material? It's not just straw, it's also grain. And every time I've tested them, I've gone and put them in a machine, my rotor losses have gone up, right? Does that mean that it's a bad thing? No, because I do have one customer who runs one pair of flat separator bars over his number two concave, only in his barley. Okay? And he does it because he uses it as a de-awning tool. Okay? He runs a very, very wide concave, but puts the flat separator bars over number two. It, that machine, or those two, because he's got a pair of them, those two machines have 34 spike rasp bars in the separation area. So the next thing is helical kickers. So your helical kicker is designed to launch the material off the back of the rotor and into your chopper or beater. If you take that first, the only pair that they come standard with, if you take them off, you can stall the crop flow coming off the back of the rotor and you can block it at the beater or chopper entry. So they're there for that purpose. And I have seen machines where they have a row of them to try and accelerate the material out the back. One season in, there's no paint on the straw hood and there's no paint on the straw spreader and there's big holes in it where the grains cut the aluminium straw spreader sheets away. My recommendation is don't do it. Find another way. And the other way is, you know, we've tried everything over 30 years and I find that nothing else works better than this setup. Right? And I know that if you ring your dealer today and say, get me 34 spike rasp bars, they're going to laugh at you. And that's because we've fitted about 5,000 of the things over here in the last two years. Okay. Yes, so what, we, what we see with it is a massive reduction in your engine load, a reduction in your fuel burn. We have one customer running 280, 240s, and he rang me at the end of his harvest and he said, yep, it's official. I have my fuel bill. Yeah, and you also mentioned about shimming up your um, shimming up your ass bars. Does that alter the um, neck of the muck, does it muck up the balance of the rotor at all or not? 
No, when we go and do that, we actually weigh every single rasp bar. So we'll strip the whole row to clean. We'll weigh them all and we'll pair them and we'll fit them opposite sides in pairs. We actually balance the whole thing as we do it. The small shim that you're going to put in changes the balance very little. So, and what you can do, guys, a millimeter is enough. So I use, I just go and buy big boxes of flat washers, which means you do have to rattle the bar all the way off and rattle it back on. But it means those washers that I buy are one mil thick. And if one mil is close enough. And if we're going to go shoot down an old rice machine, what are the modern ones you go for again? For those rice bars? Oh, if you go and buy a, a late model rice, or you go and buy a rotor out of a late model rice machine, so anything from the 1600 AFS rotor machines onwards, the, the rasp bars remain the same. The spike bar is the same all the way through. And all you're looking for is that little hook. That, that's all you need. So even if they're worn from coming out of a rice machine, they'll be fine. Okay? It's just to give you agitation. So. Any other questions that we got for Brett? He does know about Gallows, if you want to ask any questions about yellow around a couple of machine. No, Brett, just one question, please. And that's the when we had 2388s, we we rarely changed the concave modules. I actually had a neighbor who never changed his. It didn't seem to make much difference. In these flagship headers, they can make an enormous difference when you muck around with them. Like it, it's just as you're heading. So have you got any tips and tricks on them and how to set them up? So my my tip is this. And look, um, I'm going to take a leaf out of Ray Harrington's book. Um, Ray and I have known each other for years. We went and set his header up for him last harvest. There's no animosity between the old HSD and, and what I do today. You know, Ray, Ray's a good guy. The module is critical. You have to thrash it first. So go do it at the front. And, and Ray goes and says, you want to chuck a bucket full of golf balls in your feeder and they all should land on your sieve. Now, I think that's a little bit extreme because I think the golf ball's a bit too big, but get the sentiment. If you aren't smashing your material completely into pulp, you can run large skip wire concaves in everything at the back of your separation grade. You're going to guarantee that you get every grain of wheat out there. Okay. I want you to put it in your grain tank, but I have an ulterior motive, right? My real playing with these flagships started when I put a seed terminator on a 7240. And I was chasing the horsepower gain. That's when we started playing, right? And I got the horsepower to run that. But I also learned that by moving the concave, I changed my separation and I wasn't putting any grain over the back of that machine and my road losses went away, right? And so that's what this whole thing was. But there's another little bit. When you do your grain loss testing and you know you've got road losses, yeah, I know, we count the grain, don't we? Did you have a look at the weed seed that's there as well? You've gone to all of the effort of mowing it off on the ground, picking all that stuff up, and we're throwing some of it out with the grain. So if you get rid of your grain loss out of your rotor, your harvest weed seed management increases as well. So there's the old double-edged sword. You've got to get it all out. And that includes anything else that you've harvested that you want to put on your sieve. And that's regardless to whether you, you know, um, got a chaff deck or you're narrow wind rowing or whatever you're doing with your weed seed. If you don't put it on the sieve, you can't, you can't sort it. So whatever money you've put into it, if you've got rotor loss, you're probably, sorry guys, blowing it across your paddock. So does that sort of make sense? There's, there's a little rule. There's a little rule. It's, it's loose is fast. That's your first rule, isn't it, on your rules of setup? You say that three times at least. Loose is fast and fast is smooth. Is there anything else you want to ask Brett before we move, move along a little bit? Any other more of the headers? Where's the other Brett, fella? Brett, do you want to uh, make a comment on the New Hollands? Um, yeah, I will, Pete. Thanks for that. Uh, so 
about three years ago, New Holland changed their rotor. Okay. And if you look at look at the earlier machines, their rotor um, had a flat rasp bar and it had little separation pegs and there were a whole bunch of extra places. My recommendation is if you've got an earlier New Holland, go and throw all the extra rasp bars and the extra pegs on there that you can and improve your separation. The next thing, why did New Holland change their rotor? And what did they change it to? So if you look inside a case machine and you see the little blocks that are there to take your rasp bars, the current New Holland rotor has those blocks on it. They're actually the same part. And in their separation area, they started playing with spike rasp bars. Now I was standing next to two 9.90s on Monday and Tuesday this week, where we fitted two C terminators to them. Those machines have a full complement of spike rasp bars in their separation area. And anybody familiar with the New Holland, if you go and have a look at their separation grate, it's the same dimensionally as a case large skip wire concave. And you don't change it. It's in that machine all the time. And we know that the New Holland is a specialist cereal harvester. That's what it's designed to do. So take a leaf out of that book and go play with it. How do we know it's a specialist non-corn? <laughs> so if you if anyone if anyone's familiar with um, Lee Clancher, he's an author from the United States. Uh, he's write, written a great big series of books and two of them are red based. So he wrote the book Red Tractors and the book Red Combines. So when he talks about the merger between Case and New Holland, the two engineering groups didn't really get along all that well. And so they stayed doing their separate things, basically in isolation. And the red guys stayed building a specialist corn harvester. And the yellow guys stayed in Europe based, building a specialist cereal harvester. So the New Holland is European based to compete with the Lexian. The, the um, case machine is a North American based and to compete with the John Deere. We just got to go and configure them over here so they work for us. They can work for us, they can work for us and do the right things. Yeah. 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 So you've mentioned that before, um, Brett, about when we look at the feeder house, what's the difference in the feeder house for when we're looking at these corn specialist uh, harvesters versus um, the cereals? What, what are we seeing different there? And I think there's been some more recent changes, but generally, if we look at the old girls, what we're going to see? So, um, typically, as far as your feeder house goes, if you have a look at the bars across it, more often than not, if you find a, um, a cast iron bar with a, um, with a support on the back of it, um, you'll find that it has trailing edge serrations um, and they are designed to pull corn cobs up your feeder house. Um, if they're a pressed steel bar with leading serrations and they're usually smaller serrations, um, they are a cereal feeding um, feeder chain. So if you have a look at a case machine, the case machine has a cereal feeding chain in it. Um, but if you have a look at some of the others, they have a, like a big heavy cast iron bar and made made particularly uh, specifically so that they don't get bent by corn cobs. So, yeah. and when you think of that feeder chain, what what's the what's the setup? What should it be from the base of the of the feeder house? Because I think you've told me before that's pretty important. Um, yeah, your feeder floor clearance is important when you're trying to feed light crops, particularly. Um, so you need to keep it low and, and fairly close to the floor. The thing, though, is if you then try and start feeding um, a bulky canola crop or a, like you guys grow a lot of beans, uh, the, our guys over here grow lots and lots of lupins. Um, and I mean, I've, I've probably spent 2000 hours feeding lupins off a tin front into a, into a various number of red headers over the years. Um, you've got to get it up or you've got to allow it to float enough that you can get that bulk in 
to that feeder. So, um, and I know that uh, I know that um, that Ben touched on um, feeding off your front. You know, retractable finger timing is critical. But then the next thing is you also need to get that transition between the RTD or retractable finger drum and your uh, and your feeder chain as small as you possibly can because there's a dead area in there where it's just purely material push that is and flow that is going to carry that material across there. So, mm. Greg, you got a comment on um, your wind in terms of your sieves and where what material you should be getting and how you should be getting that material to flow? Well, the, the idea really is that anything light should be floated on your fan and your fan speed is very, very critical. And when you get it close to that sweet spot, um, all of your losses will sort of go away. And you, you, you're going to tune it by what Cassie said, and that is look in your repeats. Your repeats are going to tune what you're doing, right? So if you've got part heads and unthrashed heads and whatever, you can't tune that in your repeats. That's got to go to the back to the front. You've got to sort that in your concave, right? And um, a red header particularly is going to, if you've got big repeats, because the repeats processor um, smashes that up, you can get um, ground up material going round and round and round and round and down the right hand side. Um, commonly we'll get a guy who'll call us and say, I've got right hand mill loading for some unknown reason. The first thing I'm gonna do is get him to kill stall his header and have a look and see what's in his repeats and go and have a look at the right hand side of the sieve because that's what that's what it does. It does this loop around and it just flows and it builds your repeats up. So you've got to run your repeats really as low as you can and with only fluffy crap in there. You don't want any viable seed in your repeats if you can get away with it. Okay. Um, your fan speed has to be high enough to float all of your light material, but it has to be low enough that the, the grain that you're trying to separate can defeat the velocity of the air going through your sieve. That's how the thing works. Okay. And remember with your case harvester, that pre-sieve, right now, um, Cassie touched on it before and spoke about it in the Johnny. In the case, if I've got fluff in my grain tank that I can't seem to tune out, the first thing I'm going to do is close that all together and make sure it's not just dropping straight through there okay but that's your key to capacity every grain that goes through that ends up in your clean grain auger okay it goes straight to the grain tank you don't have to handle it on the sieve so the wider you can run that the higher your capacity is going to be okay 10 10 or 20 rpm and if you if it doesn't tune Go mad. Go, I'm going to go, am I playing with the right thing? I'm going to raise at 100. Oh, hang on. I can see the spike on my monitor. I'm then going to come back. All right. Got a question in the back here, Brett. Yep. Yeah, what about canola? You're talking about you've got to separate from the material, but the canola is often, that's why it's so hard, because it lays the same as the track, doesn't it? So are there any tricks with, you know, your fans, to try not to override your sieves or... You just start up in the rotor, you know, try not to get that crash so fine. Key point, try not to smash it up, right? So we've got guys over here who have gone to their case dealer and bought additional black bean grates, okay? You all familiar with those? Yep, just nod, I can see you. Yep. They've got a full set of them, and in their canola, that's what they run instead of a concave. What that black bean grate does is it's nice and smooth so it doesn't smash all of the material up. 99% of the thrashing is done at, before it even gets into the into the rotor. So we find typically that they can run those. If they're getting odd little bits of pod that have still got a seed in them, then they'll put a hard thrash concave in the right hand front. That's the only place they'll put a concave. What that does is leaves all the material much, much more intact. And the mog that ends up on your sieve is a lot less and it's in bigger pieces. And so what can happen is then it's the air velocity that holds that because the, the, the way that the seed travels through the air 
that piece of mog is a bit bigger and that's what floats it out the back. And that's why doing what we've done with all of these machines, moving the concave like we have, that's why it's paid huge dividends because we haven't smashed all that material and we've actually reduced our sieve loading dramatically. It just makes them nicer. When you go kill stall them, instead of having a big pile of material on our grain pan, we've sort of reduced it by about a third. And a lot of that fluffy and light and smashed up straw material is not on our sieve anymore. Got a question in the back here for you, Brett. Yeah, hi, Brett. Have you got any comments on uh, setting red machines up for stripper fronts? Have you had any experience there or got any comments on that? Oh, I can see the smile in the room. <laughs> so, so your stripper front's going to give you some challenges because of the way it works. But you can deal with it, but there's a process. Okay. So everyone, everyone understands what a stripper front does. So it's got a little V and I'm not sticking my fingers up at you. And it slides up the stalk and then pops the head off. As, it, as that little V slides up the stalk, it slices a little sliver of stalk material off. And it goes through the header looking like barley flag. It will block your concaves. So we got a couple of guys over here run them. And every four hours, they stop and pull the concaves out and clean them. There is a solution. That, that stuff hairpins. Okay, over the concave bar and over the wires. And that's what blocks it. Round bar concaves don't block with that material. So what you do is you run a good concave in the front because it's already thrashed anyway, but you run an extreme concave in the right, a small wire concave in the left, and then you run round bar concaves through everything. What happens with that round bar is that that flaggy material can fall off it and it will self clean right? Anyone else got any thoughts, Jim? Yeah. yeah um, what about vein settings? Like going from wheat to canola? You leave it or you clean them up with it? So if your veins are bolted in, leave them. Just leave them in the middle. Okay. If your machine has harvest command on it and you watch what it does, so they will move a bit with harvest command because what they're trying to do, they're trying to control your throughput. And generally, as your rotor angle changes, as you go up and down hills, that's when they move the most. But they will also move when the machine moves from side to side a bit. But their, but their movement is smaller. You can't get out and unbolt and shift and do them. When you go and start the machine, even with harvest command, they start off in the central position. And so as a result of that, and everything that I've tested, oh, look, I've tried slowing them down at the front so they thrash harder and speed them up at the back to exhaust the material quicker. And I've never been able to quantify a performance gain by doing them. So I just leave them in the middle. Anyone else got anything uh, they'd like to touch on? Brett does know a bit about John's as well. If you want to ask him anything about the green stuff, Ash, you oh, can yeah. ask him about the question from John Deere. Oh, yes. No, it's on the pace. Yeah. Oh, it's on the pace. Okay. Anyone else? No, you need to know. Brett has got a chance to cut the battle as well. So. Anything yeah. on cleaners? You think I've got a cleaner? We're talking about cleaners, Brett. Hell, you're scaring me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's been born into a dairy farm, ain't it? Born into a yeah, no. <laughs> no, no, no. no the, look, the last, the last cleaner I worked on was crawling around inside the burnt out wreck trying to find out what started the fire. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's all right. Hey, um, look, they're a way different beast. And um, there, aren't, there aren't the aftermarket pieces to to actually configure them. But effectively, um, you can't move the cage. You can't, the, the road is where it sits. Um, you, can, you can mess around with the elements and so on and so forth. And that's the only place that I would say, go and have a play. Um, what we've learned is 
um, increasing your ability to thrash the material early on does actually help us if we can run a wider concave position. So, look, I, I think the Massey is a is a similar sort of thing in the way that it it works um, to what the cleaner does. Um, so, yeah, I haven't crawled. I've crawled inside one to find out why it burnt to the ground, but I haven't crawled inside one to find out why it worked. So, but I do know yeah. guys that run them and swear by them. So, yeah, just a different animal. Anything else, guys? Before we move on, Brett, thanks very much for this week, mate. I really appreciate you jumping on where you are and taking time out of your busy schedule. Brett's available through Seed Terminator as well. I think wants to be in contact with him directly. He's, uh, he's told me that he's happy to have his number handed out, but only for text at the moment while he's busy flying around Western Australia, putting the Seed Terminator on machines and and fixing up other issues, but you can respond to text at night, that's sort of like he is. He responds to mine at the middle of the night most of the time. And um, you're, you, you, you can send out things to people as well, but as they, as they request them. Yeah, so one of the guys was at your school yesterday, Tom sent me an email overnight or during the day yesterday. Um, I've already sent him all the documents that tell him how to do his concave shift and that this morning. And my cheat sheet that tells him where to start from and all the little, all the little tips and tricks. And uh, yeah, we hand it out as you need to. Peter, we'll, we'll move on to, to Michael Walsh's presentation on, on Harvest Weed Seed Control now. But yeah, thanks, thanks, Brett. We'll see you again soon. Hopefully, over here in Victoria. Yeah,